is Steve. It's just a Friday night show on Status Quo. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate you joining us. Please, before we get started, hit that like button. Subscribe, folks, for sure. And by all means, kick back because we got a heck of a good show for you today. Obviously, with crypto collapsing all around, something's going on, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. My guest today is none other than Cornell Law's own Bob Hockett. He is the advisor to many folks in uh, Congress today, and hopefully Bob will be able to provide us with a really good insight to the absolute collapse of FTX and others. So without further ado, Bob Hockett, welcome, sir. Hey, great to be with you again, Steve. Thanks so much. Absolutely. So listen, I, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, FTX five minutes ago was sponsoring the Super Bowl. And, and now all of a sudden they're circling the toilet bowl. I mean, proving once again, the fair market value of crypto is zero. Vapor is zero. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world is going on right now within the crypto space? Well, I think it's a classic case of um, a, a sort of a, a bubble that, that comes into being in connection with a new technology or a perceivedly new mode of, of finance uh, that everybody sort of lets their imagine, imaginations kind of run wild on in view of the initial promise, right, that's offered by the new thing, right? So, for example, um, if you consider the so-called junk bond market uh, of the middle to later uh, 1980s, uh, at the beginning, essentially what the junk bond market was doing was enabling a kind of financing or a kind of investing that had previously not been possible, and that did, in a certain sense, add a certain kind of value insofar as it made something possible that hadn't been quite as easily possible before. The problem was that people sort of got excited about that initial promise or that sort of new increment of value that was promised by the new instrument and then got so excited about it that they started hyping it to other people and other people got caught up in the excitement of it. And in no time at all, the wealth that the new product represented was not really the product of new value added but was instead the product of other people crowding into it and buying it and thereby bidding up the price of it, right? So it became a classic sort of Ponzi sort of structure without any need of any specific Ponzi. You know, you didn't need a Charles Ponzi to do it. You didn't need a Ponzi in the form of a person who was literally scheming. All you needed was a product, the market for which developed a structure that in effect replicated the structure that we associate with a Ponzi scheme or with what's also known as a pyramid scheme, right? So Stephen gets into this particular product or this particular market at the front end. It, you know, he invests a little bit in it. He buys it relatively inexpensively because it's new and so it's not big yet. He talks other people into getting involved in it and buying it too, partly on the basis of actual legitimate value added that the product uh, represents, but he gets so many people to kind of crowd in that they drive up the price and then a huge increment or the increment of that price that's attributable to people crowding into it ends up becoming larger than the increment of that price that's attributed to the actual value added by the product, right? And then in time, more and more people crowd in and the, you know, basically at each stage of the crowding in process, more people are doing it. That's where you get that sort of pyramid shape or pyramid structure. And more and more people are actually borrowing in order to buy. That is to say, they are crowding in, in effect, with borrowed funds driving the price even higher and higher and higher. And then eventually what happens is that the credit available for people to borrow speculatively in order to buy speculatively within that new market runs out, it runs dry. And at that point, everything collapses and all the people who borrowed in order to get in are now of negative net worth, right? They all don't, they all basically have less than they began with because they owe more than they own precisely because the thing that they borrowed in order to own has now suddenly dropped in value, right? It's the classic Minsky style structure, which is effectively a pyramid structure, or again, a Ponzi style structure. And we see it again and again and again with new fad products. A quick um, sort of aside here that kind of links up, you've probably noticed, certainly I've noticed, if you go to various social media sites and you're looking at a friend's post or you're looking at somebody's Instagram post or whatever, 
whatever, and you look at the comments underneath the, the friend's post, some of them are relevant and actually pertain to the post, but tons of them will say, I got into Bitcoin, wouldn't you like to get into? If so, contact me at this particular address or this particular contact site. Has nothing to do with the post. There's a reason for that, right? The people who are doing that are people who have already bought in and they understood and understand that the continuing growth in the price of the thing that they're into depends on more people coming in and buying it. And anytime that becomes the principal driver of the price of the product, instead of, again, the actual value added and the actual sort of long-term value additive potential of the product, in other words, the fundamental value or fundamental potential of the product, anytime that kind of crowd in value comes to exceed that actual fundamental value add capacity value, that's when you know you're in that kind of Minsky territory. You're in that kind of bubble territory. You're in that basically pyramid territory. And that happened, as I mentioned before, with junk bonds. It also happened then with subprime mortgage loans and associated products about 10 to 15 years after that. And now it's, of course, happening in crypto. And the irony is that in every one of these cases, there is a clue in the name of the product in question that ought to warn you, right? If it's called a junk bond, there is a reason, right, for that word junk being used. And if it's called a subprime mortgage lend, uh, mortgage loan or subprime mortgage-based product, there's a reason for that subprime term. And sort of similarly with cryptocurrency, right, or crypto assets, as they call them, which is one of the most ironic, uh, ironical names ever conceived for this kind of product. But if the word crypto comes into it, then that's a pretty good tip off that there's something non-transparent about it, that there's something opaque and occluded and difficult to understand about it. And that's a pretty good hint that maybe one should proceed with caution if one is to proceed into this territory. Well, you know, the FTX bomb that just went off had so many ripples. I mean, there's a, there's a great article on Reuters breaks down all these different folks. I mean, it talks about FTX going bankrupt, then in Binance failing and, and uh, let's see, BlockFi failing. And uh, then you had, uh, let's see, uh, three arrows capital going down. I mean, Singapore based three AC blew up with 10 billion in crypto in 2022. And then now they're bankrupt. <laughs> and, and, and funny thing, Voyager Digital going bankrupt, Celsius Network going bankrupt, on and on and on. And, and yet at the same time, these are the same buffoons, excuse me, <laughs> same individuals, okay, that are sitting there talking about the collapse of fiat, the collapse of the nation's generative account, which it's humorous. Let's be fair. It's 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 laughable. But in that space, you nailed it. These people have got to convince others yeah. to invest in. And then what happens when the owners of these exchanges decide to buy islands in the Bahamas <laughs> instead of back their investments the way that they should with this deregulated world? Because after all, let's be fair free markets, baby, private currencies, private exchanges, all this libertarian nonsense that keeps mm -hmm. creeping into the left. It's, it's scary, but kind of, there's, there's a little bit of um, justice in this collapse to some extent, because by selling the lie, they've exposed the lie in this collapse. What, what, what is, what brought these collapses on? I mean, obviously the gentleman, and I use that term, you know, I, I, I see him as kind of a young dude that kind of blew up, had a big brain moment and voila, you know, mm. it's, it's done. You know, he, he, he literally fell apart. Yeah. What, yeah. what created this? Well, I think there are a couple of um, a couple of features that are worth singling out because these are features again that you find in earlier cases of this same general phenomenon as well, right? So, one is there always has to be some kind of a story, some kind of a narrative that essentially makes a, a, a apparent sense, or it makes say provisional or preliminary sense of what is what is otherwise a kind of difficult to understand or difficult to sort of use as a guide to action sort of event, right? So in, for example, the tech stock bubble that uh, began to inflate in the middle to late 1990s and then ultimately came a cropper uh, in early in the year of 2000, 
the story was, oh, we've got this new technology that's going to revolu revolutionize our modes of production across the economy. It's going to be usable in all the different spheres, all the different industries, all the different sectors of the economy. It's going to add value in the form of increased or boosted productivity economy wide. And so it's best to get in on the front end of this if you really want to benefit maximally from it. And so all sorts of people began crowding into tech stocks in the late 1990s, even stocks issued by firms that sort of told an interesting looking tech or interesting sounding tech story, but hadn't actually shown any profit, any records yet of profits or hadn't shown, hadn't proven any actual capacity to earn, actual capacity to exploit potential markets, right? But people sort of thought, well, if I'm going to get in on the front end, I have to get in before they actually prove their capacities to revolutionize the economy and to add all sorts of value and thus to recoup all sorts of value for initial investors. After all, if I wait until they've proven themselves, I won't make as much money. Best to get in the front end. And to a certain extent, that's true. But the problem with it is that for every one of those prospects that is ultimately going to pan out, there are probably 10 or 100 or 1,000 sort of counterpart prospects or sort of neighboring prospects that aren't, right? So what people tend to forget is that the overwhelmingly greater part of the invested money during the fad phase of a new investment product ends up being lost. It's only a relatively small number of folk who actually benefit by it. I think the same thing then happened, of course, with the subprime mortgage related products. When these were brand new, there were certain kind of synergies and certain kinds of capacities to uh, capitalize value that they captured that hadn't previously been capturable. Effectively, what they did is they recognized that some people who, according to the old actuarial models employed by lending institutions might still uh, would not tend to prosper or would not end up being able to pay off their loans indeed might be able to pay off their loans and furthermore that if you could put together portfolios of lots of different loans like this to people who who would have you know previously failed to qualify for loans according to the old actuarial models that were used to determine who to lend to they enabled more pro more actual profitable lending to be done. And in so doing, they actually enabled more people to be able to buy their own homes that had previously been able to do so. But as always happens, so much money crowded into this new technology, essentially mortgage lending technology, and so many sort of rascals were sort of invited to enter into the market, essentially to offer crap alongside the non-crap, that the crap ultimately came to sort of outweigh and sort of outsize the non-crap. And that's, of course, where you got the trouble. Now, the same thing I think has happened with crypto, right? Um, the, the initial technology, right, the original technology on which all of these so-called crypto assets were based, the so-called blockchain technology, enables all sorts of peer-to-peer -peer transacting that wasn't previously able to be done. And it also, of course, provides for the possibility of certain sort of indelible transaction records and their replication across databases or across servers so that you didn't have to worry about losing data or being unable to verify data. And that is a genuine advance or that's a genuine um, value add that we can indeed as a society make something out of that makes for better financing and better distribution of funds and better payment systems. But, you know, as usual, the, 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 the crowd of people who have essentially decided to try to capitalize on this and capture some of the gains that this legitimately potentially helpful new technology offers, the number of such people uh, who are actually, you know, scheming and scamming in this space comes fairly steadily, right, to outpace the number of people who are actually adding value. And in each of these cases, though, what you do is you start with the legitimate value add story, and then you blow it up into something bigger than what it really is. And that's what enables people to think they're getting in on it. Now, if you if you then add to that, to the value add story, something that's kind of culturally resonant in addition to, say, financially or economically resonant, like, oh, the people who are doing this are cool, right? You're cooler if you're right. one of these people than if you're not 
not one of these people. And you have a kind of, you know, as you know, there was this, you know, you've probably encountered the buzzword or the buzz phrase self-sovereignty uh, that began to sort of be disseminated or used widely to the point of, you know, making people like you and I throw up about five <laughs> to seven years ago. And it's still sort of current now or the idea of sort of taking control of your own financial and economic destiny simply by buying something that you don't actually even understand like you know, a Bitcoin, that of course sort of further accentuated the appeal. And But the whole point was not simply to accentuate the appeal, but to accentuate the appeal in order to bring even more people in. And now we're right back to that pyramid structure. You always need more people coming in now than we're in before if the people who came in before are actually to profit. Because again, at some point, the actual profit, the actual value base of profit potential comes to be exhausted and then the value base is replaced by effectively the speculation base the pyramid base right the the incoming of new quote unquote investors who are simply driving up the price of the thing that the earlier comers have already purchased and already own and hence recognize the or realize the value of or the profit so I, I have two books here one of them Belongs oh. to a gentleman named Robert Hockett. This oh guy, well, this should be over there, right in my screen. <laughs> this guy right here. This is a Bob Hockett book here. Check this book out, folks. And then I got another book right here. Let's see if I can get it in there. Oh, my good friend Brad Scott and Cloud yeah. Money. So these two books together. This is digital CBDC. It's CB. What is it? CBDCs. CBDC. Yeah. Central bank digital currency. And then this one is about the payment systems. And uh, I, I think it's important to note that what you're saying and what what I think most people that are in the know in this space are saying is that while this is not the use you would have for it, these speculative tools that are used to pump and dump, basically, mm -hmm. there are underlying values to the, the underlying technology in terms right. of blockchain, et cetera. And you've written extensively, obviously, about the central bank digital currency, which mm -hmm. I think is oftentimes completely misunderstood as, oh, it's another speculative thing that we can just you know, buy and so forth. I'm curious, would a digital CBDC have had any impact on the implosion of FTX? Or is there a different form of regulation that needs to occur to prevent the type of collapse and the type of irresponsible, uh, you know, management that FTX performed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how do how do we rein that in? How how, yeah. how does that get reined in? I think I think both. I think both of the things you mentioned are essential, and both of them are mutually complementary. And the, the, the easiest way I think to demonstrate this, or to sort of illustrate the reason that I want to say this, uh, is by reference to the paper currency, the history of paper currency, for example. Right, the digital space right now is in effect the 21st century version of the 19th century paper currency space, right? So consider paper currencies in the US as they first came to be offered and used widely in the early mid 19th century. At that time, they did represent a value add. They represented a legitimate advance in a money system because what they did is they severed the link to you know, exogenously given quantities of so-called precious metals which exogenous, were, external to the system. Externally given, right? Basically, exogenously given in the sense of so-called precious metals that people could not themselves create ex nihilo, right? That you were basically dependent on an antecedently given stock of that under the ground, right? And, you know, if you wanted to increase the gold supply or the silver supply, you had to go around digging up in various places and you had to enslave native populations and send them into silver mines as the Spanish did, of course, in South America and so forth, which is really, let's, you know, frankly, let's face it, is no way to run a money system. It's no way to have a currency system, right? And the U.S. in particular uh, in the 19th century was basically constantly, perpetually short 
of adequate supplies of these so-called precious metals or precious metal coins. And so the only way to grow the money supply in a manner that could remain in sync with the growth of the real economy itself and thus avoid slowing down the economy through a shortage of money, which, as you know, is by definition something that's deflationary, was essentially to untether money from precious metals, to sever that link, and essentially to start issuing money according as it was needed. And using paper currencies was a way to do that. And so there was a legitimate value add that came in the form of paper currencies, which were issued by private sector banks, and hence they were called, of course, banknotes. Now, the move to that new form of currency was an advance on the one hand, but it was also, uh, it gave rise to a new vulnerability on the other hand. Because once people are willing to accept paper instead of gold coins that they can sink their teeth into to see if it's really gold or something made out of, you know, basically silver coins that they can check the purity of, once they're willing to accept paper instead, a new problem emerges, or at least a new potential problem, or actually two related potential problems emerge. One is that counterfeiting becomes a thing, a possibility, because criminals like you or I can essentially imitate paper currencies more readily than we can imitate gold currencies, unless we have a bunch of gold already, in which case we don't have to counterfeit. Or issuers, even bona fide issuers of paper currencies like banks, if they are poorly regulated by the states in which they are organized, which in the 19th century they always were, there were no federally licensed banks, there were only state licensed banks, then again, the banks themselves could issue currency that ends up being bad currency because the banks themselves are bad businesses that don't run well or that aren't, you know, sort of reliable institutions to be good for the obligations that their currency issuances amount to. So what we had happen then in the 19th century in the U.S. by the mid to later 19th century was a proliferation of what were at the time called wildcat currencies issued by so-called wildcat banks. And basically there wasn't any particular currency that was issued by any public instrumentality. They were all privately issued. And so some of them were good, but only if they were issued by good private sector banks, well-operated or well-regulated or both private sector banks. And then lots of nasty, bad currencies, unreliable currencies were issued by poorly regulated banks or badly regulated banks or badly run banks, right? And it was hard to sort of sift out what were the good ones or what were the bad ones. Um, And indeed, you or I, if we were walking to walk into a general store to make a payment for something, we might have a lot of different banks, wildcat currencies in our pocket, and we might have to hand over a whole bunch of it. And then the merchant who was selling us the stuff at the general store would have to pull up a little schedule of discount rates the detached foreign exchange economy. within the domestic economy exactly foreign exchange within the domestic economy right and so they, what they would say is you know the pecos bill or the wild bill hickok bank notes are actually worth 20 percent of stated par but you know the puritan bank from puritan massachusetts or whatever sir it will you know that counts at 90 percent or 100 percent of stated par and then they'd have to add up all of these discounted values to come up with the total value that you had laid out on the counter that's not a particularly efficient efficiently running system. And by the time the Civil War broke out, it was just downright intolerable, right? Because the union, the federal government had to pay, had to requisition things and had to pay for supplies and had to pay troops and so forth in order to send them down to sort of put down the rebellion in the South. And if the federal government had to spend all of this wildcat currencies and didn't have a currency of its own that was of reliable value to spend, it couldn't prosecute the war. So a series of enactments by Congress, all then signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862, 63, and 64, essentially revolutionized the paper currency system. And what they did is they established a whole system of federally chartered national banks to operate in parallel with the state banks, all of which issued the same note, the same bank note now, no matter where they were in the country, it was called the greenback. And of course, that's the source of our current paper dollar bill. It was green and it was the same everywhere. And so these enactments essentially gave us a single unified national currency. It was not, at the, it did not have to be tied to gold or precious metals. And so the treasury department could actually, to some extent, modulate the quantity. It could issue more 
when more was needed and more could be absorbed by the productive sectors of the economy, and it could issue less when not so much was needed, or when it wasn't there, when there was too much to be absorbed by the productive sectors of the economy. And at the same time that we did this, we also then began to prohibit the issuance of private sector banknotes. So we basically, on the one hand, phased out the inadequate and the problematic and dysfunctional private sector currencies. And at the same time, we offered a reliable, stable public sector alternative that was issued by banks that were very carefully regulated by a new regime of federal bank regulation. Now, my own view for what it's worth is essentially we're going through the same evolution in the crypto space right now. And we are, in effect, in the wildcat bank equivalent of the crypto sector right now. We've got private sector crypto issuers of varying reliability, and we've got essentially a sector that's essentially unregulated at this point, although the SEC and the CFTC are two primary regulators who have the most plausible claims to being able to exercise jurisdiction over this space, are making moves to sort of move in and try to regulate, but are having little difficulty sorting out, right, who gets jurisdiction over what, which uncertainty, by the way, is itself a source of allowing or a, a sort of one of the reasons, or let's say it's a source of the allowance of the continued chaos in these particular uh, markets. So what I've been arguing and what the book that you kindly raised up uh, for the audience to look at um, is, is doing is essentially, pro um, essentially providing for the equivalent of that very evolution, right? That very move forward um, uh, in, in, in the way of, on the one hand, order, I'm sorry, offering a public sector version of digital currency that is uniform across the country and that is able to retain value through time and across space, while at the same time then phasing out and regulating out the private sector crypto that is essentially trying to do what we can do much better if we do it publicly. So what I would say, coming back at you uh, momentarily, as the libertarian strain, which is largely advancing these things, a lot of the stuff comes from a significantly right-wing perspective. Yeah. And as you look at that, one of their chief problems is they don't want the government to be the currency issuer. They right. don't want the government to be the central point of good. So it, it's like solving a problem that they purposely went out of their way to solve differently. <laughs> How right. would you, how would you affect their confidence in the CBDC? I mean, you wouldn't believe, I mean, I feel like when I read stuff about the CBDCs that I'm reading stuff about 5G wireless causing like seven legs to come out of the back of your neck. Mm -hmm. It's like over the top wrong mindedness. It makes me think that an education is very, very necessary here. I mean, obviously the entire crypto space survives by disinformation Mm -hmm. They literally talk about, hey, they're printing so much money, they're debasing. How do you debase a free floating currency? <laughs> and they're debasing right. the currency, which yeah. right there, once they say that, you go, liar, right? You know they're lying, right? <laughs> Bam, lies, lies, lies. Mm -hmm. But then the next part of that comes back to something you said a little bit earlier ago. And you talked about the 90s and the initial foray into the – um if you will, the internet space, the dot-com bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And we were talking about a lot of companies realizing revenue that hadn't even left their warehouse, hadn't even left the shop. And I think back mm -hmm. to Cisco and some of their accounting practices in the yeah. early 2000s. And I think back to MCI, who was doing faulty lying in their accounting, uh, taking leased lines and making them part of their internal asset, uh, you know, et cetera. So much Enron, on and on and on. So what I keep seeing, and I want to make sure I'm seeing this correctly because I'm pulling from our friend Bill Black here as I think through this, mm -hmm. multiple chapters of the same novel. We build mm -hmm. it up. We, we, we become too big to fail. And then what we do is we have high-speed transactions, lots of bad people involved, shadowy, no, a lot of ignorance, and lots of really cool mystique around it. And what do you end up with? You end up with massive corruption. And so we saw the savings loan crisis. We saw this in the housing crisis uh, with Fannie and Freddie and countrywide and on and on and on with Paulson, that whole gang. And by the way, those people are still doing their business out there. They didn't go away. 
Nobody got prosecuted. Nobody. And so now we're dealing with a whole new wave of these folks, right? We're dealing with uh, Madoff. Can't forget about old Bernie, the king of the Ponzi, right? Actually, kind of like a junior varsity player when you look at the grand scale of all the corruption out there. What is going on to stop that corruption now, Bob? I mean, obviously, you're working on a CBDC. Obviously, these things are going on to stabilize, but publicly, not privately. Mm-hmm. What other legislation is out there? Or what, what, what is some of the talk behind the scenes mm-hmm. as to regulatory environments that may curtail more of these frauds coming up and propping up and then stealing everyone's money? Sure. So I think uh, there, again, there are sort of two things that uh, will be done ultimately, because there are two things that always are done when we actually get a handle on these things after they've gotten out of hand and become dysfunctional to the point where they actually harm lots of innocent third parties and unsuspecting fraud victims and the like. So the two things I think that will happen and are already sort of beginning to happen are in effect sort of further developments of the general of the general type that I just mentioned. So the first thing you do is as a public, as a country, as a polity, as a nation state, as a community, you recognize explicitly the legitimate value add that is offered by the new technology in question, right? So the technology of paper currency was a a legitimate financial and monetary advance as a modality, right? Similarly, the issuance of stocks by firms and the issuance of bonds by firms, and then ultimately the issuance of derivative securities by various firms or derivatives, derivatives underwriters were legitimate financial advances that enabled the financial system, at least in potential, to function more efficiently, to function much more effectively, and to channel credit to lots of places where it belonged, productive places, in other words, that previously hadn't had access. But as always, because there's a legitimate advance posed by these new technologies, there is the potential for fraudsters to come in and overhype the potential or to pretend to be themselves realizing the the potential when they themselves really are not. And so the way you deal with this then is first, we as the public seize on the actual value add of the new technology and offer it publicly as something that is universally available to everybody on a nonprofit seeking basis. And then complementary to that offering of the safe version of this new technology, stamping out the unsafe or fraudulent versions, the pseudo versions, let's call them, because really most cryptocurrencies that are out there right now are crypto pseudo currencies. They're not real currencies. They're not real stores of value. They're not real technologies as packaged and used by the purveyors of them that will in any way aid economic growth or aid the actual sort of growth and the prosperity of the real economy or the citizenry. So on the one hand, you you establish and provide the public version. And then on the other hand, you stamp out all of the fraudulent and inadequate private versions. Now, what are we doing right now along those two lines? Well, for one thing, as you know, various regional Federal Reserve banks, the New York Fed, for example, the Boston Fed, the San Francisco Fed, are working on prototypes of a legitimate CBDC, a legitimate, in other words, digital dollar. Uh, and they're essentially doing so largely along the lines that are described in the book that you that you that, that I wrote recently, that were published recently, that you raised up. And I promise this isn't meant to be a plug, but they're doing it along the lines described in that book, by and large. There, and indeed, I'm working with several of these initiatives to try to make sure that the form that it ultimately takes that the digital dollar ultimately takes is in fact a legitimate publicly issued currency, essentially the digital equivalent of the paper dollar or the greenback. And indeed, for that reason, earlier versions of this proposal that I put out before the book, various articles and essays that I put out several years ago, actually starting about five or six years ago, are named things like the digital greenback, because I'm trying explicitly to draw the analogy to the paper greenback, right? So that's on the, on the positive side, on the sort of public offering side or the public alternative side, we are at this point finally working on developing CBDCs 
in various regional Federal Reserve banks. And in, in so doing, we're sort of following the lead of other countries that got there first. Sweden is probably the most advanced right now, with the e-krona being a purely publicly issued digital currency that is replacing almost entirely paper currency, not by law in the sense of outlawing paper currency, but just essentially people in Sweden seem to prefer to use their phones as a means of payment. And so they are using or they're going to be making payments in e-krona. Um, on the other side, the regulatory side, as I mentioned before, both the SEC and the CFTC have sort of tried to make moves in the way of regulating the digital currency markets, sort of in the way they regulate the securities markets and the derivatives markets respectively. Um, and I think the best thing that Congress could do right now is first to essentially solve this regulatory turf, answer the regulatory turf question, right? In, for as long as the SEC remains uncertain whether the CFTC is going to have ultimate jurisdiction, and for as long as the CFTC remains uncertain as to whether the SEC is going to have definitive regulatory jurisdiction, neither of them is able to advance as far as we need them to advance in developing or crafting full-on cryptocurrency regulatory regimes. Now, of course, all of, the scan, uh, all of the scammers and scoundrels out there, the fraudsters who, of course, our friend Bill our friend Bill Black would describe as the control fraudsters, they're thrilled with that, right? They want there to be uncertainty as between uh, as to who, as between the SEC and the CFTC will have jurisdiction to continue, right? Because for as long as that uncertainty continues, nothing gets regulated and they can keep doing what Sam Bankman-Fried did, right? And scam the hell out of everybody. But so the, the first thing I think we, we ought to do or that Congress could do would be essentially to settle that boundary dispute, so to speak, between the SEC and the CFTC once and for all in the crypto space. And then secondly, charge whichever agency is given that jurisdiction with the task of crafting a full-on regulatory regime. That part's not really going to be that difficult because basically regulating this sphere is going ultimately to have to look a lot like what we do in regulating the securities sphere, in regulating the commodities sphere, in regulating the derivatives sphere, uh, and so and, and even for that matter, the stocks and bonds spheres, right? Essentially the same, because the pyramid structure is the problem in all of these distinct spheres, or at least originally is the problem before regulation in all of these spheres, the form that regulation will take in the currently under-regulated sphere is going to look a lot like the form that regulation now takes in all of these previously unregulated but now regulated spheres, which again, security includes securities, commodities, um, and uh, derivatives. I, I gotta ask, this will be my final question. I gotta ask, you know, in terms of, you know, the institutionalized knowledge of the Fed and yeah. central banks in general, yeah. we see clearly that they have depoliticized things that really shouldn't be considered settled science. Like yeah. we raise interest rates to solve inflation. We uh, <laughs> lay people yeah. off to stave off inflation. We uh, cut federal spending to stave off inflation. These are all things that are like killing the host so yeah. that they can somehow or another resuscitate it later. I mean, these <laughs> right. are ridiculous prospects, but this is the Bible by which they operate from. I, I find it interesting to see archaic folks that are stuck in institutions like this. And quite frankly, the more I learn, and I, I recently spoke with Clara Matei, who has just become my spirit sister, um, <laughs> talked about the capital order. And she talks about the role of the trinity of austerity, which is interest rate hikes, you know, the obviously fiscal space reduction, eliminating public spending, and then the the force of the sack, the high firing, the, the layoffs. Yeah. Within that space, I, I find it intriguing to think about you know, crypto, rightly or wrongly, and I'm going to go wrongly here, but rightly or wrongly, it has been seen as a path out of this really cage that we've been put in through the the tools of austerity and people mm -hmm. are finding a way around that and finding a way in their mind of freedom which is laudable on its own like that the, mm -hmm. the, the desire for that is laudable however obviously that's not how it worked out and quite frankly the fed and all central banks have shown us that they're technocrats in the end they're going to do what the bible tells them to do and that's that so how does a new 
technology like this get fitted into their institutionalized beyond the debate kind of methods and procedures? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really uh, poignant question from my point of view, Stephen, because it's um, I, I mean, I wish there were a kind of a nice algorithmic answer that could be given to it or a, a nice sort of simple, straightforward solution to it. Um, I think, however, that the solution is inherently sort of multi part. Right. So and, and some of the parts are parts that really are part of the answer to the problem in those other spheres, too. And then other parts of the answer, I think, are to some extent at least unique to the new technology or the new sure. sphere that's being opened up. So to start with the former, right, the answers that are kind of, um, I think, relevant uh, in the other subsectors as well. Um, it's helpful, I think, or it's at least helpful. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's at least somewhat helpful uh, or potentially helpful to have a central monetary authority that has some degree of insulation from the immediate political pressures, right? In the sense, if you think about, go back to about 10 or 11 years to the heyday of John Boehner and um, oh, what was that other horrible person? Uh, uh, was it Eric Cantor? Uh, when oh, those, yeah. those so-called young Turks who are now probably fairly grizzled Turks uh, who were sort of, you know, uh, complacently claiming to be you know, the leaders of, of U.S. economic policy in the House of Representatives. If those people had had control over the Fed or been able to make the Fed respond immediately to what they were demanding, which, as you'll remember, was much more austerity, even than the disappointment known as Barack Obama was pushing on us. It would have been an even worse disaster, right? Things would have been much worse in 2011, 2012, and so forth, even than they already were. Maybe that would have been a good thing because maybe it would have heightened the pressure on everybody to the degree where we had a revolution. But, <laughs> but you know, apart from that, right, apart from you know making things so painful that we actually finally had a helpful revolution, they would have, you know, if they fell any anywhere short of that, they would have made things much worse than they really were. And happily, Ben Bernanke, who is certainly not a hero by any means and not you know not neither a hero of the intellect nor a hero of statesmanship was at least smart enough to know that these people were idiots and was at least insulated enough not to have to sort of bow to them or kowtow to them or do what they wanted them to do so on the one hand that can be an advantage a certain degree of insulation on the other hand obviously i'm i'm basically going aristotle here on the golden mean at the other extreme right there's the possibility of complete and utter out of unaccountability and in effect a kind of autism right a complete sort of shutting off from public understanding and public needs and also shutting off from alternative voices that are alternative to the orthodoxy that prevails in the american Econ um, academy generally and the e economics academy more specifically so the question is is there some way it seems to me the question is is there some way to on the one hand insulate a monetary authority or other finance regulatory authority from immediate pressures of sort of mob rule uh, or at least you know um autocratic uh, uh, sort of retrograde right-wing rule uh, uh, on the one hand, while still having a, a portal open to it where it can actually take seriously new perspectives or better perspectives and can actually learn from sorry experience on the other hand. Now, one way to do that might be, you know, you, you mentioned before that I had worked at the New York Fed before, the, the, that which occasioned that's happening is itself, I think, kind of interesting, and it might itself sort of provide a kind of partial model or the germ of a model for what we can do going forward, right? So after the crash of 08, to its credit, one of the things that the New York Fed as an institution did was to sort of ask itself, and by that I mean the people there began to ask themselves, what went wrong? How did we not see this coming? What did we leave out? What were we, what were we blind to that enabled all of this shit to develop right under our noses and then explode so that we weren't aware of it until it was sort of too late? And one of the things they decided when they did a sort of internal self-study was that there was too much groupthink 
around not only the New York Fed, but in the Fed system generally, that basically if Alan Greenspan said something, everybody just accepted it around there and then they all repeated it. They aped it or they you know, kind of mimicked it um, like minor birds or parrots, you know, and nobody really was uh, encouraged to think for themselves and nobody was encouraged to question any orthodoxy or any consensus opinion, so-called consensus opinion, more like a kind of imposed opinion that had been imposed upon everybody as a kind of part line. And so they thought maybe one way to guard against that would be to establish within our own midst a contrarian thinking department, in effect. In fact, what I would what I what I sort of call a kind of internal asshole department, right? They need somebody to be an asshole essentially to say, are you sure about that? Why do you say that? Isn't that possibly wrong? Aren't you being ridiculous here and thinking basically somebody to be an annoyance, right? Somebody to kind of you know pick at um, the sort of possible flaws in any particular consensus view that had developed within the institution. And what they hired me to do, I guess they heard from somebody that I was a, an asshole is they hired me <laughs> to help establish, right, that internal contrarian thinking department. And to their credit, they did give me a lot of free reign. They didn't like try to kind of come down on me or kind of, you know, shut me down when I sort of suggested various things that ought to be being done that aren't being done or suggested that maybe we not say things or do things that everybody assumes that we should do. They were open to this for a brief period. This didn't, this didn't last forever, but for a number of years, Years, they were open to this and were actually even friendly to me about it, right? They didn't even like, you know, kind of a, uh, avoid that guy. They were they would invite me to lunches, invite me to dinners. And the, the, the president of the New York Fed at the time, uh, Bill Dudley, his administrative assistant would contact me before various speeches he was to give. And she would say, Mr. Dudley would like you to suggest some sort of out of the box things that he might consider or include in some of his forthcoming speech or in this forthcoming speech or in that forthcoming speech. Um, and they were really friendly to it. And I think that the height of this, the sort of apotheosis of this came with that uh, eminent domain plan that I developed for underwater mortgage loans. You might remember that from back in 2010, 2011, 2012. So I came up with this plan for how to essentially to bust up the or clear out the underwater mortgage problem uh, and essentially to keep people in their homes and to write down their mortgage loans. And it involved the exercise of eminent domain, either by federal authority or by state authority or by local authority. And you might remember that brought a lot of um, of controversy, to put it sort of politely, a lot of very vehement uh, objection from Wall Street, um, all over Wall Street. So all sorts of banking institutions and right-wing politicians and so forth were attacking me by name for a while. This was my sort of 15 minutes of fame, so to speak, where the Wall Street Journal attacked me by name two days in one week um, uh, on its op-ed page. And in the midst of all this, I get a, a, an email from the head of research over at the New York Fed, who was himself, by the way, a politically conservative minded guy. And he said, hey, Bob, would you mind writing up, you know, a kind of a, a sort of white paper style description of the plan and its justification for us, comma, the New York Fed, comma, to post on our website? <laughs> Can you believe this? And, and he said, Holy sh yes, <laughs> I'd be happy to do this. because I had come up with this. I developed all this on my own uh, in my own in my personal capacity, not in the Fed's capacity, because, of course, without the Fed's permission to do this, I couldn't call it a Fed sort of thing. Right. But then once I had done it right, the Fed says, hey, can you do this? And I thought. Sure. And so I did it. And they put it up on the website um, and they responded to criticisms. And of course, then they were duly attacked by the Wall Street Journal as having right. been taken over by communists or whatever. Right. So, <laughs> so that kind of thing, you know, I don't want to I don't want to overplay the importance of that particular moment or that particular project. Sure or even that particular office that they asked me to kind of help start up. But what I do want to say is that that, it seems to me, is an example of the kind of thing that, as a more general practice, could be a helpful way of having it both ways in central banks or in monetary authorities, where you, in, in effect, institutionalize self-criticism. You institutionalize self-questioning as a means of sort of inoculating yourself 
against a dangerous form of groupthink of the kind that had come to dominate the entire Federal Reserve System, thanks largely to Alan Greenspan and all of the crazy Democrats and Republicans alike who sort of worshipped him for two decades uh, in the in the lead up to 2008. Something along those lines, I think, would be helpful. And in that sense, you could almost think of a department like that or a function like that within an institution like the central bank as a kind of counterpart to you or to the university or to the entire sphere of social critics within any pluralistic society that welcomes criticism, right? So you can think of the Steve Grumbines or you can think of the universities as a means by which a society reflects upon itself and criticizes itself and asks itself whether it might do a better job of what it's trying to do. And if you were actually to replicate that kind of more macro sort of institution or self-criticism capacity in a more micro way within specific public instrumentalities, that I think would be a very helpful step. And then you can have both the sort of partial insulation and the accountability or the self-criticism. Very good. Bob, we are out of time. I want to get your closing thoughts on the uh, crypto crisis. Do you foresee more of these things happening? Your last word, sir. Yeah, I think we will probably see more of the same across various so-called crypto exchanges. I don't think that that more of the same is going to affect the wider economy in the way the financial crash of 2008 did, because happily, there were enough people with enough common sense and there was enough regulatory structure left in place after the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 that you didn't see the same quantities of essentially borrowed funds being used to speculate in crypto as you did before. In other words, financial institutions on which we in the real economy, and in particular the middle and working classes depend, didn't yet get into all of this nonsense in a big way as they did in the lead up to 2008. And so the broader economy, I think, is a little bit better better insulated this time against these crashes than it was last time in 2008, 2009. That being said, I think enough money is going to be lost and enough uh, public attention is going to be drawn to these crashes that you will finally see Congress enacting meaningful legislation to, in effect, answer the jurisdictional question to begin with, the turf question, and then lay out a regulatory regime that looks a lot like bank regulation that will then be applied to this space on the other hand. And then as the CBDC finally comes online, as the, as the dollar goes digital and comes to be administered by the Fed in the same way that the paper currency is, we'll basically have that problem solved. And then you and I can turn to the next crazy Ponzi nonsense that's going to come along because there will be a successor, right? Just as surely as subprime followed uh, junk bonds and as surely as crypto followed subprime, some, you know, shit coin, shit this, shit that is going to come next too once we're done with this one. But we're not quite done with this one yet. I think we're on the way though. All right, Bob Hockett, thank you so much for joining me. Real quick, folks, if you haven't already, smash that like button, please subscribe. And by all means, because you know I'm carrying two hats here, check me out over at Real Progress in Action for the Rogue Scholar Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. And also on Saturday mornings, we release our Macro and Cheese podcast, which Bob Hockett here has been many times a guest over. Um, please check it out. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Bob, thank you so much for being a great guest. And we are out of here. Thanks, Steve. You're always the best to be with. <laughs>